Hey guys, so today we're going to take our second lesson and we're going to take aerodynamics part two and we're going to start discussing some of the principles and basic properties um, that we didn't just get discussed in the first lesson. Um, so today's lesson, um, we're going to go over some basic stuff like uh, forces in a turn, more stable, forces in a turn, um, stockages, we're also going to talk about propellers and stuff like that and we'll get going into there. Alright, so we're going to talk about forces in a turn real quick. To understand forces in a turn, we need to make sure we understand the basic principles um, and the forces acting on aircraft in level flight. So I'm going to draw a basic aircraft. Very simple. Wings here, fuselage here. We have lift acting up and weight acting down. Okay, we all remember that from last lesson. We should understand that. that's the basic um, forces acting in flight. Now when we turn, um, a couple things happen. So here's our aircraft banking right here. Here's the bank. So we're talking about the total uh, the forces that are um, within the aircraft in the turn, and we're actually going to talk about why the aircraft turn. We have our total lift here. You can see it right here. This is what we call our total lift. Our total lift isn't going to change. Um, it's going to be right here the whole time. However, our total lift actually breaks up into two components. We have a vertical component of lift and a horizontal component of lift. So our total lift is actually equated from our vertical and our horizontal component of lift. Our horizontal component of lift is actually what causes the aircraft to turn and move around there. Okay, so if you um, think about this, if you take our total, our total lift is equal to our vertical lift plus a horizontal lift. So that means when I'm turning, actually I'm losing some of that vertical component of lift. My vertical component of lift is actually what's going to be combating my weight. So if I'm losing a little bit of that vertical component of lift, I'm actually going to have to pull back a little bit on the yoke, a little bit of back pressure um, to keep the aircraft flying at a level attitude. Altitude, okay. Um, one thing that's important to understand is the law of inertia. An object at rest or moving in a straight line remaining at rest or continues to move in a straight line until acted on it by something, uh, some force. So our aircraft isn't going to actually turn until a force acts on it. This horizontal component of lift right here is actually that force that is acting on the aircraft causing it to turn um, and it's the, 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 the two components in an actual turn there alright so a little bit of like things you want to understand when you're going in a turn is rudder control and rudder usage in our 172s and our G1000 aircraft we have a ball um, ball and slip our turn coordinator it's gonna be like a little um, indicator it kinda looks like kinda looks like this here's our ball um, in old steam gauge aircraft, the actual um, system looks like a little ball. So the term stepping on the ball is where we get that. Basically, when this starts deflecting out one way, you want to step on that direction. So if it deflects to the right, you want to add a right rudder to bring the aircraft back into um, level, a, a normal uh, level turn. So there's two types of uh, uncoordinated turns. There's, le there's skidding. Um, there is skidding. And I'm going to find this real quick. Skidding and slipping, sorry, I don't want that slipping on. Skidding and slipping. So you want to think about this in like a terms of uh, turning around in a circle. So here we are turning around. If I'm skidding, that means my tail of my aircraft, instead of flying all in a line, my tail of my aircraft is actually slipping and going to the outside of the turn. It's skidding around. Think about in a car, when you skid a car, your back tail kind of fishtails out and it moves outside of the turn. And so like that, so you'll see like, you know, People who are trying to drift their cars, they'll skid around a turn. Same concept. We don't want to do that in the aircraft. We want to have a nice turn where our tail and our nose are falling in a straight line. Slipping is the opposite. It's when our, our turn is uncoordinated again, and the tail of the aircraft is actually in, inside of the uh, the turn. It's slipping. Um, slipping and skidding are two part phases of flight that we want to try to avoid. We want to make sure that we center that ball throughout the entire uh, phase of flight and that nothing um, is letting it get deflected out. Okay? So now we've talked about that for a little bit. Uh, we want to talk about forces in a climb. So what causes the aircraft to actually climb and why is it when we pull back on the yoke that we actually do get a climb? So I want you to think of it in terms of relative wind initially. So here's our airfoil right here. And here we are in a climb. So you can see my angle of attack um, initially is going to change because my relative wind initially is going to be coming from here. You know, here we are in level flight. My angle of attack, when I pull back, my angle of attack is actually going to initially change because my relative wind is still down here. Um, so I'm going to get a momentary increase in angle of attack, which is going to give me a momentary increase in lift. However, as I start climbing, I get established in that climb. That relative wind vector 
moves and it comes back here and it's almost like the normal angle of attack that it had at level flight. Um, that's because my relative wind, instead of now coming from the front of the aircraft, is coming in parallelness to almost my wing because of my thrust. Thrust is actually what's going to maintain the climb. It's going to maintain and let the aircraft actually climb higher and higher. Um, when we're out of available thrust is when the aircraft is actually going to um, hit its uh, service ceiling. Um, so just because, you know, I've always struggled with this a long time. I thought when I pitched up, my uh, I'm climbing because I'm increasing my angle of attack and I'm inc thus increasing lift. Not really. Momentarily, yes, that is true. Um, my, my lift is increasing because my angle of attack is increasing. But actually, my climb is based on, it's coming from my excess thrust that I'm putting out from my engines. Um, so that's some of the forces um, in a climb. Now in descent, um, I want you to think of them again, weight, thrust, lift, and drag, all kind of in accordance with an aircraft. So let's draw, let me draw an aircraft right here. I am descent. So here he is kind of coming down in a descent right here. He's descending. So my thrust and my weight are actually starting to come closer and closer together because since I'm bringing my nose over, this vector of thrust and this vector of weight are starting to come closer and closer. The angle of difference is uh, closer. So they're going to actually work in accordance to pull my aircraft down and to pull me down um, quicker and into the descent. So if you think about it like in a car, in a car for sense, um, in a car, the uh, aircraft, or the the, the the car, when it's going down a hill, it starts accelerating if you're on the, uh, the throttle because my gravity is actually pulling me down further. My acceleration is going that same direction. Thus, my descent is going to be greater. My speed is going to be greater. I um, mean, that's what really allows us to uh, descend in an aircraft. Okay. Um, now there's something I want to talk about. Um, before you know, It's really important to understand this before we start going to do this maneuver in the aircraft. It stalls and basically understanding what a stall is. So let's draw another wing here real quick. Oh, that's terrible. Got to work on my wing drawing. So I'm going to draw two wings. I'm going to draw a normal wing, and I'm going to draw a stalled wing. Okay. So here's my normal wing, relative angle, relative wind here, my cord line is here. So here's my angle of attack, right here. So, we talked about in a climb, you know, my relative wind vector is going to be starting to come closer and the angle of attack is going to be decreasing because my thrust is pushing me up that way. So my relative wind vector is going to increase and come closer to that cord line. Well, as you start slowing down, that relative wind vector is going to start coming back here. It's going to start slowly coming back down to parallel kind of with the earth, if you will. Um, as that's happening, the laminar flow over the wing is actually starting to break off and um, not stick to the wing and adhere to it. When we start having that separation right here, and these eddies are being formed, the, the production of lift is drastically decreased. So there's a great video on YouTube. Um, it's actually going to show when the person starts pitching up, you can start seeing these streamers along the wing. They start to spoil and they start to spin around in the air. It's because that stall is starting to accumulate on the wings, and that stall is actually um, creating a reduction of lift because the laminar flow, the smooth airflow over the wing, is separating, and it's not there. It's not present. Um, so when you exceed the critical angle of attack, the angle of attack where you will stall, um, that's what's going to happen. And that's why in the aircraft when we pitch up and we pitch up and we pitch up, eventually our relative wind is going to start coming back down, our angle of attack is going to increase, and thus we're going to stall. Um, with stalls, you're going to stall at the same angle of attack um, regardless of speed. So you can stall at the same angle of attack um, if you're going faster or slower. It just depends on the relative wind and how what your, uh, your wind vector is for that. So... Last lesson, we talked about some wing design characteristics. We talked about um, how the, the Skyhawks we fly have rectangular shaped wings. Why that's important is because stalling characteristics, we want to stall at the wing root and not the wing tip. If we stall at the wing tip, we lose aileron effectiveness and have a very tough time rolling out of a spin or a stall. So if we stall at the wing root closer to where our flaps are, we're actually going to maintain aileron effectiveness throughout the entire stall, giving us more maneuverability and better control of the aircraft through the whole stalling process. So that's why wings to stall design characters are extremely important. Another thing with that is how um, you know things like ice, snow, frost can all actually affect um, the smooth laminar flow of the uh, wind going over the wing. Anytime we disrupt that and cause you know a separation in that, you can actually make the stall um, happen quicker. So that's pretty important to understand before we start doing the maneuver stalls um, because understanding the basic properties and principles behind that is going to make it more um, concrete for you. 
So now we want to talk about basic propeller principles. Um, propellers are very important because in our Skyhawks and Sentinels, that's what provides the thrust for us. So understanding the propellers is extremely important. A couple of properties I want you to understand is um, aircraft propellers consist of two or maybe more blades um, into a central hub as which they attach. You look at our Skyhawk, we have a little hub in front of it, and then our blades come in um, and meet together there. Blades are actually simply like an airfoil. I want you to think of blades like a wing. Um, instead of, you know, our wings attacking the air, our blades attack um, the air, and that's what creates lift, and that's what we create thrust. So thrust and lift, again, are very similar. Um, basically, the lift is just producing it in a different direction, okay? Um, blades are like airfoils and produce forces that create the thrust to pull or push the aircraft through the air. Engine fin uh, furnishes the power um, needed to rotate the propeller blades through the air uh, at high speeds. Propeller transforms this um, rotary power of the engine into thrust. So that's some basic principles right there. A couple of things I want you to be able to realize with is there's a couple different types of propellers and uh, propeller systems. You can have a fixed pitch prop, which is like the, uh, the Skyhawks, which we really can't, we can't change uh, the pitch of the prop. It's just kind of set in uh, efficiency for a certain airspeed. Um, although we, and then we have a Seminole with a constant speed prop. I can change the efficiency of the propeller for the certain phase of flight I'm going into. Um, in the center, you'll see that with the blue knobs. What I'm doing is I'm fixing that uh, propeller and that pitch for a certain speed of flight, cruise flight, takeoff, um, landing, all that sort of stuff. I'm fixing that. Um, what I'm trying to avoid is slippage in it. Slippage is simply um, the distance my propeller travels in the air. So if you think about it, um, we have a propeller here. We'll have two propellers here, one here and one here. This one's traveling in very good efficiency, and this one's not. Um, so if you think about it, that a prop should spin... Um, there's a, I'm trying to find the exact, let me see, it'll be like a 74-48, it means it should travel 48 inches for each rotation, so that means as this prop is rotating and spinning through the air, I should move about 48 inches here, so if I'm moving at max efficiency, that means my propeller, when I'm moving forward, the prop should, when one full rotation, I should be moving 48 inches. Now, if you're having slippage, you might get less. So instead of getting that 48-inch movement, you're actually going to have less. What we're doing is we're actually matching the efficiency of the prop so we don't have slippage we don't miss out on the efficiency that the prop can create. Um, one thing, if you look at our propellers, you'll notice that they're actually twisted. Um, it's really a cool principle of understanding aerodynamics of why they do that. If you think of a propeller, um, the very tips of the propeller and the very center of the propeller are actually traveling at different speeds. They're traveling at different speeds because speed is directly related to the distance covered. The outside of the, the the prop, the wing tip or the prop tips actually travel a greater distance than the ones closer to the hub. Because they're traveling a greater distance, they're going at a greater speed. And we've already learned that in speed, you know, if we're looking at lift, the coefficient of lift, um, pressure, velocity, and then service area over two, you can see velocity is very important in the production of lift. And we already described and just told you that lift and thrust are very similar. So if we're gonna if we have an increase in speed. Um, we need to make if we're if we have an increase in speed, obviously we're going to have an increase in lift, and that's how we see the twisting of the blades, um, because actually what we're doing is we're actually changing the angle of attack of the wing of, of the blades attacking the air. So when we're doing that, is we want to make sure we have a balanced lift. If we had an unbalanced lift, we'd start seeing warping and some damage to the uh, the wing the propellers because there'd be differences in lift throughout the wing of the propeller. So the twisting actually is to take into account the differences in speed and account for differences in angle of attack, so we produce the same amount of lift um, equal throughout the, the prop, which gives us an equal and efficient um, thrust coming directly from the propeller. Okay, so that's some of the basic principles in props right there. It's very important to understand that, um, because we're going to start talking about prop forces and left turning tendencies. Now, not all these prop forces and these turning tendencies are left turning tendencies. Um, most so There are a couple that are right, but most of them are actually going to be um, left turning tendencies. Such as the first one, torque. For torque, you need to understand that Newton's third law of physics, that for every action is an equal and opposite reaction. I push this wall, the wall pushes right back. And so when my propeller is rotating clockwise, I'm going to be getting that, it's going this way, it's going clockwise, I'm going to have that left yaw, or the left rolling motor, excuse me, because my aircraft is wanting to turn to the right, because or the prop's turning to the right, my, my plane's going to want to roll to the left. That's torque. Um, that's a torque reaction. Every time my propeller spins one way, my plane's going to want to spin the other. Um, corkscrew effect. This one's kind of uh, tricky to see. You have to kind of visualize it. So I'll draw my aircraft again here. So 
here's my aircraft right here. Here's this prop. And this is going to be a left yawing moment. So when my aircraft is creating these, uh, it's flying through the air, it's creating these vortexes coming behind the aircraft and spiraling around it and spiraling around it. And it's actually striking the uh, left uh, horizontal stabilizer of the aircraft, the, the rudder. It's striking the left rudder, if you will. And when it strikes that left rudder, if you, this is my aircraft and this is my rudder right here, the air is flowing around it and it's striking this right here. If it's striking this, watch my uh, board, it's going to start yawing to the left. Because of that yaw to the left, I'm actually going to start feeling, um, on my takeoff roll, I'm going to start feeling that pull to the left. Um, so corkscrew and torque reaction are going to be moments to the left. Gyroscopic action is a little different. Now, gyroscopic action is more felt in tailwheel aircraft, and it's more um, important for them, but it's also important to kind of understand the basic principles of it because as a private pilot, you actually can go and get your tailwheel endorsement, so it's important to understand gyroscopic action. To understand gyroscopic action, you need to understand two very important principles um, in gyros. That's rigidity in space and precession. For this one, we want to really focus on precession. Precession states that as a force is applied to a gyro, the applied force is actually felt 90 degrees ahead of the point in the direction of rotation. So in the example, if you take a fidget spinner um, and you spin it really fast and then you apply a force, that force that you're applying is actually going to be felt 90 degrees ahead in, this, in the direction of rotation. That's important in flight because as I climb and descend, I'm actually going to have either a left or a right turning tendency based on the applied force to my uh, propeller. And then the last one is asymmetrical loading, or what we call P-factor. Um, P-factor is simply um, simply stated, um, this is how it's basically described, is the descending blade takes a bigger bite out of the ascending blade, creating asymmetrical thrust. That asymmetrical thrust is going to uh, make my aircraft yaw to the left because if I'm creating a higher force over here and a lower force over here, that force is going to go from high to low. It's going to push me to that left. It's going to push me to the left. Now, saying it takes a bigger bite out of the aircraft doesn't really explain what happened, or a bigger bite out of the wind doesn't explain what actually happens and occurs when that's happening. Um, you need to think of it that my descending blade is actually attacking the air quicker. It's attacking it faster and it's coming out and it's slicing at the air, whereas my other blade is retreating from the air. When my blade's attacking it, um, it's going at a higher velocity. We talked about the co the lift equation. My velocity is squared, so as my velocity increases, so is my lift. If I'm retreating from the air, my velocity is actually decreasing, thus my lift, lift is going to decrease as well. So that's asymmetrical loading. My attacking blade is taking a bigger chop, a bigger velocity out of the air than my retreating blade. Um, so those are four uh, turning tendencies in the aircraft, and that's important to understand because when you're on the uh, takeoff roll, you'll actually feel the aircraft lurch to the left, and you have to apply that right rudder to account for that. Um, with torque, you know, I said it's a rolling moment, but if you think about that, if we're on the ground and we're on a rolling, it's a rolling moment, you, people don't think, oh, if it's rolling, I'm not going to feel it until I start getting in the air. Not really. Just because it's a rolling moment doesn't mean that force isn't applied on the ground. If we have that rolling moment and it's going to start rolling us to the left because the aircraft's props turn to the right, it's going to put more friction on that left tire. That left tire is going to want to travel slower. And when this left tire travels slower, I'm going to start lurching and turning toward the left. Um, that's why torque is very important to understand and the ground roll as well. Um, so these are important factors in flight because if you don't actually understand them, you could get surprised by the aircraft when it lurches one direction or the other. Okay, now we're going to transition to something known as load factors or loading of the aircraft. Um, load factors, um, I've got a couple of really cool stories I'll tell about this when we start getting into it, but load factor is basically is the force of the aircraft imposed by the maneuverability, the maneuver of the aircraft or the weight. Um, many people when we talk about load factors, we talk about G's, pulling G's, we think about fighter aircraft. But in the uh, 172's you will experience um, somewhere probably close to maybe 2 G's of force and some steeper turns. Um, not really more than that. But to understand load factors, each aircraft um, is equipped for a certain type of loading and type of load factor. Some aircraft can experience higher load factors than, the, than others. You know, our 172 can't experience the same type of load factors in the G's pulled in a you know, F-18. Um, each aircraft is actually specifically designed for a specific purpose, like we've talked in other lessons. Um, but yeah, remember that those specific lessons are those specific reasoning for the design of the aircraft um, is going to actually you know limit the loading of the aircraft and load factors. So if you think about it, a load factor of three means the total load of the aircraft uh, is three times its weight. So if I'm pulling three G's, um, my normal weight at one G is actually now it's three times greater. So if I'm 100 pounds and then I pull 3 Gs, now I feel like I'm 300 pounds. It's three times greater, okay? So what happens with Gs force is basically if you think about the law of inertia, my body doesn't want to change direction. 
because I'm turning this way, actually, I want to keep going this way. So when I pull back on the aircraft, my, my body doesn't want to move. It wants to sit in the seat. So when I pull up, that G's, that gravity is going to push me in my seat. Same thing when I push the nose over, law of inertia, I want to stay, my body wants to stay where it is. Um, so I push the nose over, my body, my body is going to want to stay in that presence. So we feel the negative forces of G's. Um, so limit load factors. Um, we said uh, it's important that for an aircraft to be able to handle um, load factors without any structural damage. So if you think about this, if I start pulling G's in an aircraft that over G my aircraft, I can actually cause structural damage. And that's why it's important to understand what it is um, and where, you, where your aircraft um, falls in. There's three categories your aircraft can fall in, um, basic understanding. There's a couple more categories, but for a basic understanding of this, um, it's normal utility and acrobatic. So our 172s, a normal um, you know, envelope, it's 3.8 positive Gs to negative 1.52 negative Gs. And then utility category is 4.4 positive Gs to negative 1.76, those are negative Gs. Acrobatic is 6.0 positive Gs to negative 3.0 Gs. Now, they're apparently um, the extras that we fly at Liberty also can go in like a like an unlimited acrobatic, which can go even farther than that. And there's different categories, but for learning purposes, it's important to understand these three basic categories because you can kind of get an idea for what your aircraft is um, designed for. So one thing, um, a maneuver we always do in private pilot um, and even in commercial is steep turns and understanding the load factors in a steep turn. Um, at a constant altitude during a coordinated turn to any aircraft, the load factor is a result of centrifugal force and weight. Okay, so if you think about this, as I start turning and I start pulling back on my stick to you know maintain altitude, uh, I'm gonna start feeling that load factor pulling me into my seat. Anytime you get over about 45 degrees of bank, you're really gonna start feeling the effects of the loading on the aircraft. Um, and that's super important to understand because it makes you understand the feeling for when you're turning. Um, there's a really great chart in the P-Hack. It's going to show like a little graph um, in my angle of bank in relation to my um, my G's pulled. So as you can see, my bank increases, um, my G is also going to increase. And at about the 45 degree mark, you'll see that G factor really just shoot up. Because after about 45 degrees, the G factors and the load factor you're stressing on the wings is actually going to start greatly increasing. Um, Another thing that's important to understand is that loading load factor actually affects stalling speed. If I have if I load up the aircraft in a bunch of Gs, uh, my stalling speed is going to be a lot higher. Um, there's an example in the book that an aircraft with an unaccelerated stalling speed of 100, uh, 50 knots could be stalled at 100 knots by inducing a load factor of 4 Gs. So I can stall at twice my airspeed if I'm pulling 4 more Gs uh, than normal. So that's important to understand because you get in those accelerated turns that we practice. When I start turning and I pull back on the stick, uh, I start feeling, you know, I start putting those G's on the aircraft. My aircraft is going to stall at a higher airspeed than maybe normal because of the induced load factor of pushing down the aircraft and the wings. Um, so that's why it's important to understand that because when you're coming to landing, you don't want to start turning and banking and pulling because you're already at a low enough airspeed. And, turn, and making that turn on final at a low airspeed and really cranking it in there, putting that load factor, you can put yourself in a, a spin or a stall close to the ground, which are almost never recoverable. So that's why it's important to understand that loading of the aircraft is um, is extremely important in understanding stalling on um, the aircraft as well. Um, so loading during flight maneuvers, we talked about turns. Um, you, when you're turning, you're going to start feeling that load factor impressed on the wings. Stalls. Um, in a stall, there is actually some G-forces felt. Um, we talked about how before that, even though load factor can affect stall speeds, but in a stall, you actually can have negative Gs because that initial drop in the nose can cause negative Gs as well um, and spins and everything like that. Basically, what we want to start getting to is understanding the VG diagram. This is a diagram you can find um, online or in the P-Hack. It gives a great example. Basically, it's going to show me uh, my maneuvering speed and why maneuvering speed is important. Um, if you don't understand maneuvering speed, look at this diagram. It'll explain it perfectly. Maneuvering speed is a speed at which I can safely um, fully deflect an aircraft's uh, control service in one direction and not experience structural failure. Basically, I'm going to stall the aircraft before I break my aircraft is the maneuvering speed. If I pull back full deflection um, on the stick and I want to climb up, um, before, my aircraft is going to stall before I start whipping, ripping wings off and breaking stuff. So if you look at that diagram, you can, you can see as my speed increases, I get closer to that um, and maybe beyond my maneuvering speed, I can start, if I full, go full deflection you know, one way or another on the stick, I can actually cause structural damage before I stall the aircraft. So that's why it's important for us to understand maneuvering speed and how our weight changes that 
if I have a greater weight, I have a greater maneuvering speed. If I have a less of a weight, I have a less of a uh, maneuvering speed. So understanding where your maneuvering speed is for that day of flight and what you're going to be doing is extremely important in understanding if I do a full deflection, if I do a full deflection this way or that way, or I pull back on a stick, I push over a stick, am I going to break my aircraft or am I going to stall my aircraft? Because um, we'd much rather stall the aircraft than break it because um, you can recover from a stall, you might not be able to recover from breaking something, structural damage. So that's why the VG diagram is a great example of how these speeds are broken up. It goes from VNO, normal operating zone, and then also VNE to show you where you could do the aircraft um, if you do something like a full deflection of uh, a control system. So that's extremely important to understand. Um, so next I want to talk about um, rate of turn and radius of turn. Rate of turn and radius of turn is extremely important in ground reference maneuvers. When you start thinking of how quickly I can turn this aircraft around, I want you to think about one thing, ground speed. How fast my ground speed is going is actually going to be directly related to how big my turn is going to be. If I'm going 150 knots and I need to turn around in a short distance, I'm probably not going to be able to do it. And if I'm going to do it, I'm going to have to put a lot of loading on the aircraft to really crank it and bank it around. Okay, So maybe slowing down and maybe not as much as a bank to get around and turn in that valley. So the instance the PHAT gives in the book is you're flying in a canyon. Um, you have two options. You can either really try to crank it and bank it around there, which you could have ended up stalling because um, your speed and you're putting so much loading on it on the force of it, or you can slow down and turn into a nice gentle turn, banking around and turning around. So the option they give you are you know it's really trying to like speed up and cranking around or slowing down and making a turn safe, safely around. Um, it's smart to maybe slow down and turn safely and quickly around because the slower I am, the smaller my radius of turn is going to be. If you think about a fighter jet in a 172, um, yes, he might be able to beat me around in a turn, but my radius of turn is going to be so much smaller than his because he's going so much faster. His ground speed is so much faster than mine. So when we start doing these ground reference maneuvers and we start doing turns around a point, um, you got to think about wind direction, how it's affecting my ground speed. If my ground speed is increasing, I'm going to need to bank, in the, bank a little bit more because I'm going to be making a bigger radius of turn. If my ground speed is decreasing, I want to shallow my bank out because I want to keep a nice and unified circle around the same point. So that's why it's important to start kind of understanding what rate of turn and radius to turn will look like um, when you're flying. So next I want to get into weight and balance. And this is where I got a couple of great stories of the, show the importance of weight and balance. So my dad, he was a C-5 pilot. Um, C-5 is a cargo aircraft. Um, they can handle huge loads. They can take um, big loads to small places and small airports. They're actually extremely well-built aircraft by Lockheed Martin. Um, but they do have weight and balance restrictions. They do have restrictions on how much they can carry. Um, weight and balance is important to understand because weight and balance and how much aircraft weighs is directly related to takeoff roll and landing roll. So for my story, it's important to, for you guys to understand before I even tell it that if I'm a heavy aircraft, I'm going to have a longer takeoff roll than normal. So my dad was taking, um, he was flying a couple fire trucks um, somewhere. This was the biggest load he's ever flown. And the flight engineer was specifically instructed to make sure all water is removed from the fire trucks because, you know, fire trucks are big. And heavy, but if they are full with water, they're going to be even heavier. Um, so that's what they were instructed to do. And then my, you know, my dad gets in the aircraft, and they start rolling down the runway, getting ready to take off. And he notices that the takeoff roll took about a thousand, fifteen hundred feet longer uh, than he was expecting. And so he started thinking, he started thinking, he started thinking, and it clicked. They didn't take the water out. The water was still in the fire trucks. So that means he had, he was grossly overweight, and that his takeoff roll was greatly increased. So now what does he start thinking about? He's like, crap. I'm going to an airport with a smaller runway, um, am I going to be able to land in that distance? Luckily, they were able to burn off fuel and they were able to land, but I'm sure my dad had a few cho choose choice words for those you know, flight engineers afterwards because you know, they directly you know, almost harmed the aircraft. Now, that's an extreme example because um, you know, maybe it wasn't my dad's fault as much as, as much as the flight engineers, but for understanding our weight and balance in the Skyhawk, that's all on us as the pilots. We're the ones who load the aircraft. We're the ones who put people in seats and stuff. We're the ones that fill up the fuel and understand how much fuel we can take. So understanding weight and balance and what it does to my center of gravity and where it moves is extremely important in understanding if I can have a safe and productive flight. If my center of gravity is too far forward and I'm going on a long cross country, having a far center of gravity, um, a, a forward center of gravity is actually going to negatively affect performance and efficiency in a, um, in a long cross country. And then again, the vice versa, if I'm going up and doing stalls and maneuvering, I don't want to have an aft CG because my control services are less effective. My stall characteristics are worse and stuff like that. So understanding where my center of gravity is and where it falls in that envelope is extremely important in keeping a pilot safe and managing the aircraft in flight. Um, 
So some of the effects of weight on flight performance. I said takeoff and climb performance of an aircraft um, determine the traits and all that stuff like that. Um, and some aircraft, it is not possible to fill all seats. Like with 172, I can't fill every single seat in my 172 and fill up fuel and go flying for a long distance. It's it's not practical. Practicable. All right. And then effective weight of stability and controllability. And um, we already talked about having a forward and aft CG. Another example I want to tell you is a story. I think it was a 747 that was flying in Afghanistan. It was flying a bunch of uh, heavy equipment um, for the military. Um, they were all there were three of them lined up um, in the back of the aircraft. Number one, the one towards the front of the aircraft. Um, broke free and slid back into uh, load two. Load two then broke and slid back to load three. So this aircraft now that was already configured for flight and taking off, and as they're rotating out, all their weight just went to the back of the aircraft. So my center of gravity went all the way uh, as far aft as it could go. And now the aircraft is in a nose-up position. I'm getting close to that stall characteristic. My aileron surfaces are not working. My rudder, uh, my elevators aren't working because my center of gravity is so far um, back towards them that it's having a very negligible effect on the aircraft. So now they put themselves in a stall and they can't recover. Um, the video is actually pretty, um, you know, it's, it's a little terrifying because, you know, the aircraft doesn't end up crashing because they couldn't control it. That's just an extreme, a very extreme example of why weight and balance is extremely important. Understanding where your center of gravity um, falls because it's going to be directly related to the stability and controllability of that aircraft. Um, so yeah, like I said, these are some of the very basic important principles in aerodynamics, um, effects of weight and balance, propeller principles, the four um, turning tendencies, um, turning, climbing, and descending in, a st uh, in, in flight. How these all relate and why they're important, you got to start thinking that um, I want to put myself ahead of the aircraft. I, wanna, I already want to know what's going to happen aerodynamically before I even input that control surface. If I'm behind the aircraft and I'm not really sure what's going to happen if I do this or this or what's happening in the stall, I'm behind the aircraft, and that can lead to a dangerous uh, situation, a dangerous mindset, because I'm so far behind the aircraft that I'm not going to control, um, recover in time. I can be able to control the aircraft in time. So understanding aerodynamics puts yourself ahead of the aircraft and puts you ahead of the, uh, the flight to give yourself a better and a safer understanding of what's going on, and it let, it, it, gives, it makes also a better training environment because when I can understand what's going to happen um, when I do something, what's happening with the wings out there, what's happening with my riders and my ailerons. It makes me a better pilot and a better understanding of everything that's going on. Um, so that completes aerodynamics parts one and part two. Um, next week we're going to start talking about we're going to go even more in depth into um, weight and balance.